Poland as a political entity, as has often been the case throughout history, was divided and subjugated when Witold Dostoevsky entered the world in January 1913. When he was one, World War I broke out, and Germany declared war on Russia, and the Polish lands were in the way. The family's political connections allowed them to escape to Moscow, where the late Tsarist regime had instituted the first Russian parliament, called the Duma. His father, Yosef, and four of his uncles were all involved with the center-right National Democracy Party, or Indexia, as they were close to Roman Domovsky, who started the party. It's likely that Vitold's middle name, Roman, was an homage to Domovsky. Yosef was musical, but politics ruled his life. Indexia believed, and this is simplifying greatly, that Russian protection was preferable, as it was the best path to an independent, or at least autonomous, Poland. And maybe everything would have gone to plan had Russia not fallen to pieces. Wave after wave of revolution upended the Tsarist regime, installed the Bolsheviks, and gave way to a bloody civil war in the process. Yosef and one of his brothers, Marian, were arrested in Murmansk, imprisoned for a few months, and then taken out back and shot without even so much as a sham trial in September 1918. Vitold wasn't yet six years old. With the end of the war, the Lutosławskis returned to a battered Poland with a battered family. Their de facto patriarch was now Witold's uncle, Kashimierz, a medical doctor and later priest, also active in politics. All the while, Witold was getting piano lessons whenever he could and however it was possible. With the World War and then a shorter conflict between the Poles and the Soviets, the family's land in Drozdovo was ravished. Witold and his mother, Maria, spent time between Drozdovo and Warsaw. Witold would get violin lessons for six years, starting when he was 13. And he started composing when he was nine, and produced two early violin sonatas that he called naive. The first modern piece he heard was Karol Zemanowski's Third Symphony, and he was blown away by the rich sounds that his elder could juice out of an orchestra. Luzuswavsky studied mathematics at the university in Warsaw, and after one year tacked on composition at the conservatory. His composition teacher was another Vitold, Malashevsky, one-time pupil of Nikolai Rimsky korsakov who took him on as a conservatory student in 1932 after several years of private study. Malashevsky had been a member of the Belyev Circle, an ensemble cast sequel to the smaller and more ideologically driven Mighty Handful, and he inherited some unusual ideas about form and structure. To him, all music was either introductory, narrative, transitional, or concluding, and he emphasized the link between introductory and concluding material. Ludoswavsky always talked about the lasting impression of these ideas, of setting up listeners' expectations in order to then subvert them. The psychological approach to form is absolutely essential in my work, he later said. He cared about organizing the process of perception. Music wasn't just sounds in time. It was also the emotional reactions of the listeners, and how to do all of this in a musical language all his own. This is the key to understanding repetition in Lutosławski. Things will recur because he needs to set up sonic objects or cues or signals of some kind. And to him, music shouldn't just expect the listener to be constantly attentive. Brahms' first movements always exhausted him to listen to because Brahms is always developing his ideas. If your attention lapses during a Brahms piece, you're likely to lose where you are. Throughout his career, he kept to the core values of classicism. Things like proportionality and structure, clearly delineated forms, making music that was abstract and autonomous. Following Haydn, he made sure he led listeners through a piece, and he gave them moments of repose along the way. He was not a neoclassical composer, but was influenced by that aesthetic, particularly the symphonies of Albert Roussel. Neoclassical pieces from the interwar years were usually more neo-baroque than anything, and Lutosławski did once say that Baroque music was his spiritual home. To greatly simplify, most neoclassicists imitated some of the surface structures of Baroque and classical era pieces and didn't care as much about structure. Ludoswavsky was the opposite. Ludoswavsky was Malashevsky's most famous pupil by a long shot, but since whatever writings Malashevsky left burned in World War II, what we know about Malashevsky's ideas are mostly through Ludoswavsky, who adapted them as his own. Malashevsky believed that music ought to always communicate its alignment with its category. If you're writing something introductory, it could sound fantastic, but that didn't mean anything if it didn't sound introductory. 
Narrative was the only one of these categories where the musical content was more important than its place in the form. Ludoswowski swapped Malashevsky's narrative section with the term static. In a sense, the listener is neither being drawn forward through the music or nor remembering something that already happened. For the other kinds of material, Ludoswowski preferred the term dynamic, thus reducing his teacher's four categories to a mere two. He liked two movement forms, where fragmentary material in the first is succeeded by one where everything comes together and moves and really goes somewhere. It's not the only form he uses, but it crops up a good deal, nowhere more prominently than in the second symphony. Ludoswowski talked about how his music set up the expectations that then paid off in the finale. In other words, a piece teaches you how to listen to it and then concludes. This connects with what composer and Ludoswowski expert Stephen Stuckey called end-accented form, where the finale is the payoff, the most substantive movement. The music usually has one identifiable climactic moment in every piece, usually very close to the end. And he was a particular fan of triple meter, and so a lot of his music is felt in three. Poland wasn't a hotbed of avant-garde activity when Ludoswowski was a student. Jemanowski, for all his innovations, was a bit of a maverick, a romantic at heart. Malashevsky may have loved him some Beethoven, but Polish musical tastes revolved around France and Russia. Scriabin and Foray were about as far as it went. So when Ludoswowski produced his symphonic variations in 1938, after a few years of tinkering, he was never a fast worker. He was certainly new and different and exciting. Malashevsky called it ugly.
It had to wait until June 1939 for its world premiere in Krakow under the baton of Grzegorz Fitelberg, likely the only Polish conductor who would have given the piece a shot. It was a burst of confidence that Lutosławski needed. It signaled the end of his brief fascination with Zimanowski, whose music he now found overly hysterical. <laughs> If you're up on your Polish history, you'll know 1939, not, not a great year. The Poles knew another war was coming. Ludoswowski spent a year in military service training in communications. His pianist's fingers were very well suited to the communication of Morse code. By the time the variations premiered, tensions were high enough that Ludoswowski was mobilized, which screwed over his plans to go off to Paris and study with Nadia Boulanger. When the German invasion finally came in September, Ludoswowski was put in charge of the radio unit of the Polish First Army, a key cog in the machine that kept Polish forces in contact with one another. But the speed of the Nazi Blitzkrieg was too much, and he was captured within the month. The Soviets swooped in, and another partition of Poland was effectively complete. Being a Nazi prisoner of war was actually preferable to the Soviet treatment, if you can believe that. If you were a Pole captured fighting the Red Army, you were shot in the middle of the forest and swept into a mass grave if you were lucky. Henry Klutosławski, Witold's brother, was one of the unlucky ones. He was transported to the furthest reaches of Siberia and forced to mine for gold and build infrastructure until his body gave out from exhaustion, malnutrition, and the sheer unrelenting cold. Witold, by contrast, escaped captivity after only eight days while on the march through the middle of nowhere. He walked about 250 miles back to Warsaw. His promising large ensemble career was on indefinite hiatus. He and his people were now struggling to survive against occupiers who wanted to erase Polish identity. Poles were employed as musicians, but had to play German music. After the Jews and the Roma, Lutosławski once said, we Slavs were hated most by the Nazis. Throughout the war, Lutosławski was part of an underground Polish musical scene, since they would face harsh punishment if they so much as read a chamber piece in someone's apartment. The only acceptable public performance venues were in the cafes. Ludoswowski was looking for any job he could get, and a quartet of cabaret singers needed a new ringleader, and their old boss was out of the country when the war began and couldn't make it back. So his first gigs were arranging and playing for them in a cafe called Zimianska. The cafe was just opposite Sztuka i Moda, the cafe where he and his old classmate, fellow composer Andrzej Panufnik, played about 200 arrangements of serious concert rep that could not be done in the concert halls. The duo had some close run-ins with the authorities, but otherwise made the best of a bad situation. The two knew the writer Stanisław Digget before the war, and one day he brought along his sister Danuta, who would become Lutosławski's wife in October 1946. Danuta was from an architectural family and would be of great help when it came time to format Witold's scores for engraving. With no hope of a performance any time soon, Lutosławski began work on his first symphony, of all things, first by putting together small woodwind cannons in an attempt to piece together his own harmonic language. It took six years to complete, which I think is actually pretty fast under the circumstances. It was lucky to survive the war at all. It was still in sketch form when the Warsaw Uprising began, and Lutosławski had to decide what pieces to preserve when he had to evacuate the city. Almost all the early piano duets were burned to ash, with the exception of the Paganini variations, which would not become one of his most played pieces, since he would later orchestrate it in 1978. Thank you. 
The Warsaw Uprising was a brave effort by the combined Polish resistance to liberate the capital from Nazi rule in the late summer of 1944. Though they had timed the effort ahead of the Soviet forces' imminent move into the region, the Red Army inexplicably stopped just east of the city, watching as the uprising was quelled and the Nazis razed the city to the ground in retaliation. Soviet forces entered Warsaw only after there was no one left to liberate and hardly a building standing. Stalin knew that maximizing Polish death and destruction would only make the country easier to control after the war, as if things like geographic proximity and history within the Russian sphere of influence didn't make that a foregone conclusion. The Soviet Union was an empire in all but name. When the war ended and Poland began to rebuild, it seemed at first like Ludoswowski might be the victim of unfortunate circumstances. Most of what he'd written was incinerated, but he found ways through. The Symphonic Variations got a few plays, as did a new woodwind trio, an extension of those experimental duet canons from the war years. He did a bunch of commercial work in various capacities for years to come. More on that in a minute. He worked his way up to become the secretary and treasurer of the Polish Composers Union, usually initialized from the Polish as ZKP. And I know enough about myself to know not even to attempt this one, mangling enough names here already, I'm sure. He kept this role until the artistic crackdowns began. Poland enjoyed only a breath of fresh air between the end of World War II and the descent of Stalinism. Having recently assumed the position of world's top mustachioed mass-murdering psychopath, Stalin was eager to expand his sphere of influence. The Zhdanov Doctrine kept artists in the USSR in check, more on that in my Kachaturian video, and the functionaries of the new Polish People's Republic imitated the cultural mandates of Andrzej Zdanov further east. The net result was a de facto artistic conservatism. Communist regimes wanted accessible, preferably propagandistic music. Any piece that didn't satisfy them was deemed formalist and censured. Any work that arguably put form over content was fair game. There were nominal rules, but in practice, this was a way for those in power to put the screws on any artist they didn't like. Poland's discount Zdanov was one Wojmierz Sikorski. Frankly, there's not a lot of info on this guy I can read, but it comes across as a guy who, as per usual in totalitarian environments, let all the power go to his head. And so, Lutosławski's first symphony, once it was finally played, gained the dubious distinction as the first Polish piece censured on the basis of its formalism. It was premiered in 1948, but didn't get its Warsaw premiere until 1949. In the meantime, the ZKP was made to declare that socialist realism, the Soviet's main artistic doctrine, was to be the law of the land in Poland. The Minister of Culture spoke to us for four and a half hours, Lutosławski later recalled, giving some ideology of socialist realism and against formalism. What those terms mean, he said, I couldn't tell because I don't understand them. I don't know what formalism is. In 1981, Ludoswowski gave a speech that described what it was like as a composer dealing with socialist realism. We were to break with everything that modernism represented, he said, and return to a simple 19th century tonal language. Vocal music, based on carefully chosen propaganda texts, had priority over instrumental pieces. This was a form of attack on the truthfulness of art. Composers were forced to hide the most important pieces in a drawer, while their previous works were not performed. Critics aimed to destroy all signs of individuality. For many of us, it was all the cause of deep psychological depression. In November 1948, Ludoswowski was pushed out of his leading role in the Union. The symphony's Warsaw premiere was a minor scandal. Russian officials and their Polish stooges made a show of walking out, and the vice minister of Polish culture allegedly said that Lutosławski should be thrown under a streetcar for having written that piece. Lutosławski wasn't completely happy with it either. He said it reminded him of wrong note harmonies where traditional chords were spiked with added dissonance, a practice he disliked and its detractors pointed to his habit of thickening lines by turning them into chords, which in fairness can sound a little bit muddy.
It'd take him a few more pieces to really master the art of orchestration. He wanted a more personal and more rigorous method of composition. The symphony wouldn't be heard again until almost 1960. So, symphony band, you're on the outs, you hardly recognize your government, and all you've seriously trained in is music. What do you do? Ludoswavsky turned to anywhere but the concert hall. Through about 1960, most of his income came from doing songs and other things like 75 different scores for Polish radio, things like the background music for poetry readings, early audiobooks done over the airwaves, incidental music for over a dozen plays, and a bunch of children's songs. I could not compose as I wanted, Lutosławski famously said, so I composed as I was able. He even wrote popular music for Polish singers under the pseudonym of Dervid between 1957 and 1963. He referred to all these incidental, more accessible tonal compositions and arrangements as writing with the left hand which I guess tells us he was right-handed, but there was a lot more overlap between his popular and artistic sides than you might expect, and certainly more than he let on. His theatrical and radio music were recycled in the Concerto for Orchestra and even the opening of Mi Parti. Scholars have noted that there is both direct recycled material and more general textural and formal connections. Lutoswavsky didn't want to write intentionally simple stuff, but he was fine with writing simpler music if he felt there was a genuine social need for it. He did write a short overture for strings that was played in Czechoslovakia, otherwise there was something to be said about keeping a low profile, trying not to sacrifice your artistry, and just working your way back into the good graces of the authorities. By 1951, he was restored to his executive position on the ZKP board. His pursuit of functional music had to do more with his opportunism and his willingness to find whatever compositional work came his way, rather than adherence to some doctrine. There was a real market for folk music, which had been massively suppressed under Nazi occupation. His dozen folk melodies, Melodia Ludova, from 1945, were adopted by the Marxist regime and were a staple of Polish piano students for generations to come. There's a lot of Bartok in these pieces, from the folk influence to the kinds of harmonic substitutions that he used. He was beginning to experiment with exclusively harmonizing a vocal line using one of two different intervals. It was a form of harmonic continuo, a freely composed supporting line to a main horizontal line. In his words, it was composing chromatic accompaniments to diatonic melodies. This Bartok vibe meshed well with their edicts of socialist realism. It's important to stress that the folk interest came before the political doctrines, they just happened to work well together. So you can imagine his shock when, in 1954, he was awarded the Prime Minister's Prize for his children's songs. He viewed them as part of keeping his head down, out of the way, politically neutral. But nothing could truly be neutral under the totalitarian thumb. The authorities, he said, mistook his kids' music as evidence of his compliance with the regime. The prize signaled his full rehabilitation from the crime of committing the first symphony. They thought he was being a good boy. Ludoswavsky was shocked that anyone could consider his children's songs artistic. Having pared down his forces and musical language, he now had opportunities to scale them back up again. When the Warsaw Philharmonic was formed, Ludoswavsky's first idea was to expand his folky material for full orchestra. Over the next four years, this became his Concerto for Orchestra which premiered in November 1954 and won state prizes the year afterwards.
The folk influences contributed to his rehabilitation, but like the first symphony, he was not really happy with this piece. He felt that its popularity misrepresented what he did to the public. The concerto was one of his last pieces to use folk material. His subsequent dance preludes were, in his own words, a farewell to folklore. It was the end of an era. Stalinism was dead with the man himself. The fate of the Eastern Bloc was uncertain. His old buddy Panofnik had defected to the West. By 1957, Ludoswavsky's music would undergo a dramatic change. Starting from just after his first symphony, Lutosławski filled hundreds of pages with not just sketches, but what Lutosławski scholar Martina Hama called the parallel path. Thing is, he didn't put dates on these sketches, so scholars have to do the guesswork. These are scores of pages filled with 12-tone ideas, unthinkable in the Poland of a few years prior. He used graphs in the process. Again, all these sketches are undated, so we don't know if the graphs were the real first step. Thing is, these were all formalist procedures, beyond what had gotten him in trouble with the First Symphony. But a lot was changing in Poland. In 1956, the leader of communist Poland, Bolesław Bierut, suffered a mysterious death in Moscow while on party business. Władysław Gomułka became the new leader, and Sikorsky was transferred out of the culture ministership to control of radio and TV. Gomułka was initially a reformer, and in these early years of the Polish thaw, the ZKP liberalized. Marder Kashimir Sarotsky was the new president, and staunch Marxist musicologists like Zofia Lisa quit. They organized a modern music festival, the Warsaw Autumn which became one of the few musical cultural meeting points between East and West. Poland would have its fair share of turmoil for the rest of the decade, but this liberalization seemed to hold for the compositional world. Ludoswavsky was invited to speak at the ZKP's 1957 meeting, and he eloquently opined on the state of the Polish musical psyche at the hands of bureaucracies. Liberalization meant greater contact with the West and greater freedom to follow paths that were not socialist realism. Ludoswavsky's language after the Concerto for Orchestra and into this more liberal period embraced the 12-tone technique, but not in a way anybody would have expected. He believed that his development of the 12-tone technique in his own language was the most important thing that he did in terms of compositional technique, so that's what we're diving into first. From 1957 onwards, he was interested in the full chromatic, the aggregate, as it's called. This was at the height of high modernism in places like Darmstadt and their summer new music courses. But he didn't like the Darmstadt crew. He found them too self-righteous. They disposed with themes and motifs. Ludoswavsky thought those concepts were highly charged, radioactive in his words, to the listener. He preferred Debussy to Schoenberg. He considered it artistically important to not only write your music, but to develop the techniques of your musical language alongside the finished pieces. Contact with the avant-garde was fueled by an inner need to release and refine an inner sound world. Serialism, as he wrote in his working diary, replaced long-range activity with a state. It just was. It had no motion, no potential for dynamism, no way to be introductory, no way to be conclusive. He also believed it was necessary for music to have an underlying order and structure. It couldn't just be anything goes. Individuality wasn't really about what new techniques you could come up with. Novelty, he wrote, grows older faster than anything else. The bulk of contemporary music, he lamented, 
is being written as a succession of certain sonic phenomena, which I think is his description of Stockhausen's moment form, as well as Cage's desire to let sounds be themselves. He called such modernist practices anti-form. In contrast, Ludeswalfsky cared about the length of sections and how those sections fit into a well-crafted whole. So a 12-tone for sure, but not in the mainline serial tradition. It seems to have emerged out of a study of Stravinsky and his polychords. The opening of the first symphony is a polychord. It's two half-diminished seventh chords smashed on top of one another, and it's also all thirds. This is important because Ludeswalfsky was interested in the aggregate, but not in the full array of intervals. You might think this practice of getting an aggregate through limiting intervals is kind of Webern-like, and you would be right. Ludoswowski does give us a proper tone row in the third movement of the first symphony. But it's important to stress that Ludoswowski was thinking harmonically. He could turn his harmonies sideways and get tone rows, and he does that sometimes, but that's not his focus. He builds large sonorities out of two or three different intervals, max. If he ever published or formalized his working method, it would have clarified how he heard intervals. We know that for him, sevenths were centripetal and wanted to move in, while ninths were centrifugal and wanted to move out. And no, I don't know what he meant by that. <laughs> if a chord had more than three different types of intervals between adjacent notes, it was gray, lacking in specific color. Gray was also a word he used to describe high bassoons and mid-range clarinets, so yeah, the terminology can be confusing. Some of that's a matter of just translating terms. Take the Polish word akcja, which means something like action or plot in English. He found it comparable to the way a drama unfolds. It wasn't programmatic, just a series of logical events that made sense in succession. Listeners should have a unified experience of large-scale piece, which was the essence of the pieces that he called symphonies. These were orchestral pieces with this through-line of axia, this plot. His Livre pour Orchestre began as a collection of separate pieces, but it came out with a more coherent sense of form than he ever planned. It's possible he found that the lever was just more symphonic, that it had more of an axia than he had planned at the start, hence why he wanted to change the name. If he'd had his wish, this lever might have become his third symphony, but the letter outlining his change of direction did not make it to Hagen, where the director of the Hagen Municipal Orchestra, a guy named Berthold Lehmann, who had commissioned the piece, already announced it under its old and ultimately permanent title. Biographer and analyst Charles Bodman Ray speculated that his theatrical and radio work during the Stalin years influenced this dramatic approach to form, that is, form as drama. And the piece that makes the most sense through this lens is the Cello Concerto. Ludoswowski said he borrowed ideas from the theater, and its open conflict between soloists and orchestra is easily interpreted as a metaphor for the artist's struggle against a repressive regime. Instead of Kiti, Mitsislav Rostropovich liked to play up the drama and its extra musical connotations, probably because he endured a very similar regime just a little further east. <laughs> Thank you. 
The notion of interval limitation shows how Lutoskowski's technique differs from orthodox pitch class set theory. Let's take a major seventh chord. For Lutoskowski, this bore a particular color because each adjacent note was one of two thirds, interval classes three and four. So set theory looks at all possible intervals. So you have your threes and fours, but you also have a one and you have two fives. If you look at all possible intervals, it clutters the analysis. So Lutoskowski analysis that I read while assembling the script avoided set theory, preferring instead to look only at the adjacent intervals as Lutoskowski did. Additionally, he treats fifths, tritones, and fourths all a little bit differently. He's able to think of fourths and fifths as separate intervals, which, again, not typical of orthodox set theory. Wider intervals like tritones and fifths were cold to his ears, or sometimes he'd say serene. He tended towards a temperature metaphor, but he wasn't exclusive to that. So if you take this modified set theory approach and only look at the intervals between neighboring notes, Ludoswavsky's chords are elementary, if they only contain one interval, simple, if they only have two different types of intervals, and complex, if there are three intervals or more. If you're limiting yourself to the elementary chords and you want to make something with all 12 notes, you've got a couple of options. You've got a circle of fourths or fifths, interval class 5, or half steps, interval class 1. Ludoswavsky does sound these huge cluster chords in the Second Symphony and in Chain 3, it's a tone cluster, but Ludoswavsky disliked that term because critics used it to describe any close and crunchy chord, even if it wasn't a true cluster. He liked to make these chords vertically symmetrical, either around a central pitch or a central interval. Hence why he had to do all of this sketching. It's stuff he was figuring out for himself as he was writing pieces that used these techniques. His sketch pages are full of 12-tone rows built from very limited intervals. I think this was just to get a tactile sense of working with these materials, what it meant to really limit your intervals. The best way to internalize this for some people is to just write it all down, hence Parallel Path. Ludoswavsky also thought about different planes of chords, or strands to use his term. To make three strands work and make a lot of aggregates, the chords of each strand had to be four notes each and contain only a small subset of intervals. The intervals in each strand tended to be thirds and fourths, so the local harmonies in each strand can resemble traditional tonal chords, and he was keen on spacing his lowest strand wider in order to adhere to the laws of acoustics and to keep things from sounding muddy. The advantage to the strand approach was that each strand could be colored by a specific timbre. The term local harmony can also describe the relationship between one strand and another. If three strands were groupings of orchestral choirs, as he liked to do, local harmony might be what the brass is doing in the middle strand, or how the pitches of the brass are determined by the relationship to what the strings are doing in the lowest strand and what the woodwinds are doing in the highest one. Because he used 12-tone collections so often, the collections used in these strands have to be complementary. So if eight pitches are in the strings, that leaves the remaining four for the brass in this example. The first piece to use this new approach were the five songs, originally for soprano and piano, written in 1957 and dedicated to Nadia Boulanger. I can only imagine what she would have thought about these. Polish is, as you've heard throughout this video, a difficult language to pronounce if you don't grow up with it. It's not exactly an international language, let's put it that way. So most of Ludoswabski's mature vocal music, after the five songs, sets French instead. Singers are usually taught to sing in French, even if they can't speak the language itself. By the time these songs were first performed, he had already achieved fame 
for his string orchestra piece Music of Mourning, written as a memoriam to Bartok, which also uses these chord aggregates. Ludoslavsky hit another crossroads with his orchestral three postludes. He had control over pitch and harmony and form, but he couldn't get timing or texture or rhythm quite right. That was solved in one single Road to Damascus moment when Ludoslavsky heard John Cage's otherworldly piano concerto on the radio. Ludoslavsky wasn't influenced by the surface of the music, and upon second listening, didn't like Cage's piece at all. On that first listening, he heard past the piece into Cage's philosophy. Cage embraced chance and chaos, a world where the composer just builds the frame, delineates the spectrum of possibilities in a piece, and relies on performers who give the whole process a genuine respect. Ludoslavsky didn't go nearly that far. Both used aleatory procedures, a word related to dice throwing etymologically, and Ludoslavsky, these were used to restrict the possibilities of individual performers at individual moments. In Ludoslavsky's music, the structure and outcome of a piece are clearly defined. A piece was still, in his words, an object in time, but one where small-scale aleatorism is used like a spice in cooking. It gives you a specific flavor that you wouldn't otherwise have, and the dish wouldn't be the same thing without it, but it's not the main substance. Like, if you forget the garlic flakes in an everything bagel, uh, you will still end up making a bagel. Uh, you won't end up like with a risotto or something. In Cage, you might end up with a risotto. In Ludoslavsky, you're always going to end up with the bagel. Applying aleatory to the level of the micro-rhythm takes advantage of the expressive variations inherent in good solo playing. For this reason, Ludoslavsky's use of chance is usually called controlled aleatorism or limited aleatorism. Cage's radical chance procedures mean that two performances of a work can be very different. Ludoslavsky's music doesn't have that high level of variation. He doesn't use indeterminacy and he doesn't give the performers agency over the structure of a piece or its constituent sections. He doesn't let the performers just improvise. There's two major exceptions to this. There's one passage in the Livre Orchestra where he gives the xylophone an outline of pitches. He's using the xylophone here along with unpitched percussion, so I don't think he really cares about the pitches, he just wants that woody timbre. And the xylophone does roughly what the tom-toms are doing. The similarities between these lines is a good example of his use of heterophony, a rare texture in Western music, where multiple instruments play variations on the same melody at the same time. Heterophony is found in what Ludoslavsky called bundles, two or more instruments of similar timbre doing different variations on the same thing at the same time. This simulates objects going in and out of focus visually. In his string ensemble piece, Preludes and Fugue, he gives the conductor the option of playing the preludes out of published order if not all the movements were going to be on the program. I think he was thinking about practicality because it's kind of a long piece if you play it all the way through. It's kind of a choice in form, but it's not up to the performer, and it's not done in the moment of performance. The conductor has to make that decision well in advance. Ludoslavsky structured the beginning of each prelude to feature six of the strings playing six of the pitches, and the end of each to feature another six playing the complement, the other six pitches. So each prelude can begin while the previous one is concluding, which I suppose is one way to make sure your audience doesn't clap between movements. 
There's a lot of elision in Lutosławski's forms, where one thing dovetails into another. He would later expand this idea into something called chaining, which lent its name to a trio of unrelated pieces, Chains 1, 2, and 3. Lutosławski's first masterpiece to use these techniques was Venetian games. Boxes denote sections of alternating character, where recurring active material trades off with more restrained episodes. Very Baroque form, this first movement. <laughs> Ludoswavsky understood it to be, in Malashevsky's terms, introductory. Ludoswavsky liked to map his old teacher's theory of four distinct types of music directly onto four movement forms. The finale, conclusionary music maybe, features superimposed blocks of aleatorism, the result being this ever-shifting texture that doesn't sound too far removed from Ligeti's concurrent interests in micropolyphony. In each of these composers, the careful compositional planning contributes towards an overall effect. The technique itself is just completely swallowed up.
In gratitude for Cage's piece having opened his mind to new ways of organizing his music, Ludoswowski sent the score to Venetian Games to Cage, both as a show of gratitude and so a sample could be included in Cage's book Notations. Ludoswowski conducted quite a bit, mostly his own music, and modestly said it was because his scores asked so many unusual techniques of conductors that he wanted to prove that they were possible to conduct. Aleatoric music for ensemble almost always requires a conductor. Somebody's got to cue in and out of these ad-lib sections where the ensemble is unpulsed and uncoordinated. Each individual part in one of these sections is typically quite easy. Each line doesn't have to be hard. Complexity results when you layer uncoordinated simplicity. It's an effect that just couldn't be obtained any other way. But there are a few downsides to this approach. For one thing, ensembles weren't used to the notation, since he had to come up with solutions to new problems. Cage's work was far more radical, sure, but the U.S. was a different cultural context, and the performers who played Cage weren't expecting traditional notation. Second, the unique notation practices demanded by uncoordinated, borderline free sections of music meant that Lutoswavsky sometimes spent more time formatting a piece than writing it. Recall this was, of course, far before computers came along to help with this job. Add to this the mid-century modernist engraving fad of cut-out scores, and Ludoswowski's pieces become these masterpieces of visual art. Modern problems required modern solutions. In his three poems of Henri Michaud from the early 60s, he published separate choral and orchestral scores to get his desired misalignment. In his 1964 string quartet, he developed these ideas to the point that a full score was unnecessary. Ludoswowski thought it was impossible, since any score would imply alignment between instruments that wasn't there, and thus be a completely different work. So it would have been all fine and dandy, except the Little Salle Quartet, which was going to premiere it, preferred playing from score, as some quartets like to do, and they wanted one just to understand what they were doing. Danuta came to the rescue with her architectural background, and the full score we have today is thanks to her innovations. An interesting point of comparison is not Cage, but Cage's American contemporary Earl Brown, whose open form pieces were inspired by the mobiles of the sculptor Alexander Calder. Ludoswowski borrowed the same term to describe the quartet. 
but as usual, Ludoslavsky was using these avant-garde terms in a much more restrained way. Ludoslavsky meant a mobility of layers, a loosening of the temporal sinew between sections, a fluidity of flow comparable to sculpting in liquid. Working in this way, Ludoslavsky had to make sure that whatever happened was something that he was okay with. And in the quartet, the players are not supposed to know beforehand exactly what everyone else is going to do. Ludoslavsky didn't end up writing much chamber music. It was too limited and transparent compared to the orchestra, and his techniques work best with high timbral contrast and with groups of instruments. His orchestration tends to be more choir-based. He was more likely to have all the brass enter at one time than introduce composite colors using different instruments within different sections. I don't think this is a weakness. His music is so based on contrasts, and this having maximum timbral separation just works really, really well. He rarely calls for unusual instruments, either. He snubs even the most common auxiliaries. He's liable to ask for three oboes in a wind passage instead of the more usual two oboes plus English horn. The aleatoric sections were effectively ensemble gestures, very particular texture and dense sound leading to harmonic stasis. This problem of melody persisted with Mi Parti. More than a few scholars consider it Ludoslavsky's masterpiece, but the composer himself was as per usual, dissatisfied with how he built melody from harmony. Ultimately, the problem was a foreground-background issue, one seemingly solvable only when setting text, in which case the soloist is kind of forced to be lyrical. Parole Tissé and Les Espaces du Sommier, settings of French Surrealist poetry, stand out in this period. Why French Surrealism? Yeah, I'd argue that nobody does Surrealism better than the French. French was a suitably international language, as we've discussed, one that Ludoslavsky knew, which resolved the problem of singing in Polish or having texts translated. Ludoslavsky, maybe uniquely, had a formal idea for a piece in mind and then went about finding a text to fit the form. Usually we composers find a text we like and use its form at least as a starting point for the setting. And Lutoslavsky avoided text painting, even when the poetry he set mentioned particular instruments or sounds. Because Ludoslavsky didn't want to give the harmonic rhythm over to chance, controlled aleatory freezes the harmony in place. This works when controlled aleatory is for primarily static sections of music, it's less useful when he's trying to make the music move in one direction or another. By his fourth and final symphony, the aleatoric sections take a back seat. He began to mess with ways of producing these sections using more traditional notation.
The notion of limited aleatory was new at the time, but boy, it caught on quick. The resulting sound had a huge amount of complexity out of the layering of simple materials, in things like bundles and strands. Compare a wild aleatoric moment from Lutosławski to an equally high intensity moment from Brian Fernihill. Fernihill's method is to maximize the information, to overload the performer. Lutosławski was the opposite. He wanted his players to have room in their brains for interpretation while still hitting all the notes, because he believed that much contemporary music assumed superhuman virtuosity. I want to include into the repertoire of compositional means that wealth which is presented by the individual psyche of the human being, the performer, he wrote. He avoided extended techniques out of respect for his players. He feared asking for non-standard techniques because he didn't want to be responsible for players damaging their instruments. The kind of things you see in his younger colleagues like Penderecki just don't happen in his music save for extreme outliers. His double concerto has a few extended oboe techniques, and only I think because he was writing for Heinz Holliger who could really pull them off. Lutosławski's 12-tone procedures occasionally extended beyond 12 tones, though again always with the performers in mind. Quarter tones appear in much of his mature string writing as compressions of established half-step motifs, or as embellishments to intensify the local voice leading, a neighboring quarter tone instead of a semitone. There is some disagreement among Lutosławski's scholars about how he was thinking of these microintervals. The composer followed Bartok's prediction that music would evolve to split the half-step into ever further gradations, but he tempered this with the practical considerations of string playing. He wanted to access that infinite continuum of pitch, and sometimes he does this with glissandi, but he felt he got a similar and slightly different effect when he asked for quarter tones. He knew that players weren't going to get these exactly in tune, especially in a whole string section moving at a quick pace. He doesn't leap to and from quarter tones, rather they're usually just passing in neighbor tones that in practice replicate the effect of a constantly changing and warbling pitch. He got more control over it by notating these with definite pitches as opposed to a glissando. It's harder to be precise notating with glissandi, especially on smaller instruments like the violin and viola. They're just smaller. Your fingers just get really bunched up together. On the cello and double bass, precisely tuned quarter tones are more practical. And in the cello concerto, Ludoswowski asks the cellist to play them precisely because they can't be mistaken for glissandi. This was new even for Rostropovich, but it's relatively idiomatic as long as cellists follow Rostropovich's fingerings. On the listener's side, his goal was to create a definite complex of psychological experiences. It wasn't so much the notes themselves, but what would be perceived on the other end. In an era when so many artists were focused on notes and processes and seemingly indifferent to listeners' experiences, Ludoswowski wasn't just willing to go there, he made it the goal of his art. Why are you interrupting my filming again, young lady? That's a light, it's not your enemy. The only reason to write the next piece, he said as late as the 1980s, is to correct what is irritating in the last one. Most of the time he found his finished works caricatures of the original concept that he had. Ludoswowski said the first piece of his truly mature style was Epitaph, a short and otherwise unassuming oboe and piano piece.
Without an orchestra, he was forced to cut things down to size. It signaled a move away from full 12 tone aggregates towards concerto like works where there's some kind of solo instrument, some focal point for a newfound lyricism. Having come to a satisfactory language, which discarded a lot of the aleatoric stuff that was so hard to format and engrave, Ludoslavsky was able to compose much faster from 1979 onwards. Political unrest in the 1980s with the rise of the Solidarity Movement out of a strike in the Gdansk shipyards led to a period of martial law in Poland as the communist government attempted to suppress a trade union that was not under their thumb. Solidarity was driven underground and would take some years to regroup when it would reemerge as a political force in Poland's retransition to democracy. In solidarity with Solidarity, Ludoswowski focused his energies outside of Poland and refused any photo op that would have legitimized the regime, part of a wide-ranging artistic boycott. Ludoswowski was one of the biggest participating names, and was awarded the Solidarity Prize in 1983 for having sent the recording of the Third Symphony to a church in Gdansk. Ludoswowski had worked on a Third Symphony in fits and starts, and was only able to complete it after he'd refined his style. And all three of his chain pieces I mentioned earlier come from this late era too, although they have nothing to do with one another in terms of material. The first chain was a Sinfonietta piece, as Michael Viner wanted a piece for his ensemble. The shift of style helped Viner get that commission fulfilled. As long as Lutoswowski was obsessed with 12 tone aggregates and lots of potential for aleatoric activity, he'd never written a piece for an outfit of just 14 players, all one to a part. Chain 1 was Lutoswowski's opportunity to reintroduce aggregates, reintroduce aleatorism into the late style, as a sinfonietta implies a more soloistic treatment of the players than, say, a chamber orchestra. Ludoswowski was working with simpler textures, but he was still thinking 12-tone. Weren't so many 12-note chords, but he was still thinking about groups and their complements. Four-note chords accompanying melodic lines made up of some arrangement of the remaining eight notes, say. He gained enormous confidence in this late period. Pieces like Chain 2 and Partita he ranked as his best. As for the other works, he said, they always seem to me to contain something irritating. When awards and commissions began to accrue later in life, he usually asked that funds be redirected to scholarships to support younger Polish composers get the opportunities that he never got to enjoy. He cared about the future of Polish music, but he never held a faculty post and only taught in the context of summer programs up through 1968. I've spent years developing my own musical language, he said, and have had no injury left to carefully study the efforts of others. He died in February 1994 after a short bout with cancer at the age of 81, having received Poland's highest prize, the reinstated Order of the White Eagle, shortly before his death. Danuta, his inseparable companion in life, followed him into death only 11 weeks later, having used the intervening time to get her late husband's affairs in order to safeguard their privacy for the future. The couple habitually destroyed their correspondence to keep them away from biographers' prying eyes. His privacy was paramount. An era when some of the biggest names in music had pretty big media personalities, Ludoswowski kept to himself. The less one said, he figured, the less what one did say could be politically twisted. Ludoswowski teaches us that even in the most miserable circumstances, there are always going to be learning opportunities. Had he not been forced into writing the children's songs that he did in the late 40s and early 50s, he may not have developed the unique approach to intervallic material that made his music sound like his music. Ludoswowski's role in the history of Polish music is complicated, mostly because his mature pieces don't have any connection to the project of Polish nationalism or Polish folk music. Chopin was a big influence, but not in the way he usually is for composers. He always was cagey about what exactly he found so stimulating in Chopin's music. It certainly wasn't the sense of Polish nationalism. He wasn't writing mazurkas or polonaises or any of that. He liked Chopin's ballades, which, like the Beethoven string quartets, he thought led listeners through the piece. Those composers understood the listener's psychology of perception. And he held an affinity for plenty of non-Polish composers. 
Ravel, Massian, and Elliot Carter, who was the only living composer to be the dedicatee of a Lutoslavsky piece with slides. Carter would return the favor with his own gras. Carter's an interesting comparison. Lutoslavsky's sound is about limiting the intervals in any given moment, whereas Carter was the opposite. He loved the all-interval tetrachords because they gave you all the intervals in a mere four notes. There's a personal dimension to Lutoslavsky's work that is often overlooked. He appreciated having control. He prized orderliness, down to the way he'd host a dinner party. Growing up in an environment of such chaos, his response was to make chaos submit to his control. It's a psychological explanation of his obsession with controlled aleatory. Though he wrote abstract and absolute music, there was a deep personal dimension to pieces like the string quartet or Partida. Stephen Stuckey reported that Lutoslavsky cried every time he heard those pieces played. All the same, Lutoslavsky was adamant about what music meant, what music could mean. Music doesn't express any specific feelings, he said. It only constitutes the formal framework in which, while listening, everyone experiences their own emotions according to their own personality.